KPBS, where news matters. Good morning. I'm Alan Ray. And I'm Wayne Right now, we're going to tackle times in California. The economic troubles facing San Diego will be the focus of Mayor Jerry Sanders' annual State of the City report. A 60% hike in rates where either one or both people Hello, everyone. I'm Joanne Ferry, and thanks for joining us. We're preempting San Diego Week this holiday weekend, and instead, we'll air an Envision San Diego special. We'll hear a little bit more about the Obama administration's proposed public health care plan at the end of the program from Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary of Health and Human Services. But first, here's Right to Health. Tonight, you'll meet a woman who tried to refinance her house to pay for an MRI, and a man who went blind because he couldn't afford to see a doctor. And we'll tell you about a patient whose care in hospital costs more than a million dollars. He can't pay, the government won't pay, so just who's picking up the tab? You'll be surprised. These stories replay themselves in just about any city in America. It's the fallout from a privatized health care system that is bloated with administration costs. Would universal health care make us healthier? We asked the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation to help us answer that question. Here is the CBC's Wabgishi Grice in Winnipeg, the coldest big city in the world, right in the middle of Canada. Hello, Joanne. Canadians have had universal health care for more than 50 years. We don't call it socialized medicine here. Doctors remain in private practice, only they don't bill their patients. They bill the government for their services. Here, cost doesn't keep people away from the doctor. Waiting lists do. Tonight, I'll tell you how people cope with those waiting lists. And you'll meet some seniors who say they would never trade universal health care for American-style medicine, but they would like some changes here in Canada. Joanne? Thanks, Wabgishig. I've lived on both sides of the border. There is a great mythology that surrounds the American health care system in Canada, and one that exists here, too, about the Canadian system. There's the belief that America will leave you to die on the street if you can't pay your hospital bill. And here in the U.S., many believe in Canada you may die waiting to get care. So let's begin there. What happens here in San Diego County when you don't have health insurance and you don't have any money? Meet Leanne Brady. 52-year-old Leanne Brady loved being a waitress, but she hasn't worked for more than a year. She has back pain and can't lift her arms above her head. I could no longer carry the plates without severe pain, shaking. Brady needs an MRI, but like 46 million other Americans, that's one in seven, she doesn't have health insurance. If I need a back surgery right now, forget it. I mean, I'll probably wind up crippled. A few years ago, Brady even tried to refinance her house to pay for the test, but couldn't. Her credit wasn't good enough. I actually think her shoulder would get much better if she could have surgery. Dr. Jeffrey Gordon is Brady's doctor. He sees her regularly for about $15 a visit, about one-tenth what a doctor could bill for an office visit. What I would only call shocking gap. Dr. Gordon lectures to other doctors on what's wrong with America's health care system. It's set up to make money for insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and surgical instrument companies. According to the California Medical Association, private health insurance companies made more than $4 billion in profit last year and spent another $6 billion on administrative costs. In this country, if you have the money or good insurance, you'll virtually never wait for something like an MRI. But if you're broke, you'll never even make it on a list. Don't get sick in America. That's the way it is. Nice and deep. If you do get sick in America and you don't have insurance, you'll probably end up here, in the emergency room. A federal law requires all emergency rooms to treat patients regardless of their ability to pay. As a result, emergency room doctors are seeing patients for illnesses that should have been diagnosed and treated by primary care doctors such as renal disease, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension. They could have probably prevented them from coming in from this acute problem and a huge bill and hospitalization. February 26th, 25th. 
We met Betty Ann Bayless in the emergency room. She has insurance, but it only pays for her breathing medication 10 months out of a year. And I can't afford it too much. So I have to skip, you know, maybe one day, two days, three, four days at the most on my medicine. Making the problem worse is the increasing cost of health insurance. Premiums have nearly doubled in the past eight years, and that's affecting the middle class. Employers are dropping them from health care plans, or their premiums are so expensive, they're dropping out on their own. Dr. Gordon supports a publicly funded health system like Canada. He tells the story of his Canadian friend's son who hurt his knee in California and didn't have insurance. The doctor's advice? Fly home to Canada. I bet you people in Canada are saying, I wonder how long he waited to have a surgery. Waiting is, uh, is much better than going without or going broke or going bankrupt or having to take money from your mortgage or from your home equity or your kid's college fund to pay for your medical care. It's sophisticated medical technology that can pinpoint problems in the body from your brain to your heart to your limbs. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, uses magnets and radio waves to take a closer look at soft tissue. And health officials say getting an MRI in Manitoba has never been better. I think we have improved things and the volume of the diagnostic imaging procedures has gone up an awful lot over the years. Compared to the United States, Canada has fewer MRI machines per capita, but does more scans per machine. And patients get the scans free of charge. But there's a catch. If it's not an emergency, you'll have to wait. Extremely painful. Um, it's hard to walk. Teresa Clifton broke her foot last spring. But months after she got the cast off, she was still in pain. After CT scans and x-rays, doctors couldn't figure out why. They finally said, okay, we're going to send you for an MRI. We think it's mus muscle or tissue damage. Um, but now I'm on a four-month waiting list for it. She knows others need the scans more than she does. Still, that wait is too long. And if the price was right, she'd pay for one. I would really like to get this fixed, find out what's wrong with it, because the last thing I want to do is be taking medication for like the rest of my life. For non-urgent MRIs, the wait is typically five to eight weeks. But the provincial government's health department recently changed how doctors order them, and that's bumped wait times up to 14 weeks. Health officials say they're working on getting that back down. A unit like this scans 29 patients a day. This clinic also recently expanded its operations to seven days a week to see even more patients. The regional health authority also has plans to add another MRI unit to another Winnipeg facility. Moves it hopes will reduce wait times. Historically, we've done well on almost all of the wait list issues. Still, health officials acknowledge that's little comfort for people who are in pain. And if their health issues escalate, they'll be bumped up for an MRI. So doctors are asking people on waiting lists to be patient. I'm not overly concerned that there's a major health risk in any of that, uh, but it's more uh, should they have the right to buy that if they can buy a steak at the grocery store, uh, you know, can they buy an MR? That, I think, is the, is the controversy. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the... Uh, quality of and the availability of imaging services in Manitoba. I definitely prefer our Canadian medical system over the states, but when you do, if you do get an opportunity to pay a couple extra bucks to get down to the problem, I kind of like that as well. More than half of all bankruptcies filed in the United States are triggered by medical bills. Evidence the system takes its toll financially. But are we healthier in the U.S. than Canada? We took a look at a very common disease caused by an even more common condition, diabetes and obesity. The statistics tell us we're the fattest nation in the world, and it's making us sick, even blind. For a diabetic, bacon does not count as a meat. Every Monday at this support group at the Center for the Blind, Armando Carrillo learns about what he shouldn't eat to control his type 2 diabetes. It's information he should have had years ago, information that could have saved his sight. It was a, a slow thing. Carrillo was working in a California restaurant back in the early 90s when he got sick. He was feeling weak and constantly going to the bathroom. He didn't see a doctor because he didn't have insurance. He was finally diagnosed with type 2 diabetes when he went to the emergency room because he hurt his knee. Soon after, Carrillo went blind. 
at least Armando has his life still. And so many of the people that have come through this center, um, this was fatal to them, this lack of insurance. Type 2 diabetes is preventable. In the U.S., 1 in 13 people are affected by the disease. Among the Latino population, that rate is even higher, 1 in 10. The reason? Obesity, one of the main causes of type 2 diabetes. The U.S. is the fattest country in the world. In just one generation, obesity rates have doubled, tripled among children. What we're seeing now is cardiovascular disease in teens. Uh, and that is very scary. Fast food and TV contribute to our waistlines. So does all this sitting in traffic. And as the economy struggles, it's becoming more difficult for Americans to buy healthy food. But for example, a hamburger costs less than a veggie burger. On average, people living in low-income neighborhoods have five fast food outlets and convenience stores near their home, twice the number than their more affluent neighbors. Obesity rates are higher in America than in Canada, especially among women. And despite the year-round good weather and access to all this, more Californians are overweight than in a place like Manitoba, Canada, where cold weather and snow keep people indoors six months a year. Experts say it may come down to health care and a simple visit to a family doctor. But government programs like Medicare don't kick in until people with diabetes are on dialysis. My brother, my aunt, my uncle. Carrillo lists all his family members who also have diabetes. He's learning now why the disease has affected his family. And now that Carrillo's blind and had a kidney transplant, he has two government-funded health care plans. The irony of the American health care system is not lost on a man who worked all his life but couldn't afford to see a doctor to prevent a disease that in the end cost him his vision and a kidney and now costs the government tens of thousands of dollars in care and disability. For John Payton, it's simple. The more he runs, the longer he'll live. Just three years ago, he weighed twice as much as he does today. I took a look at myself in the mirror and thought, wow, look at me, I'm 400 pounds, massively overweight. I, I had to do something with, uh, with myself, otherwise I was going to be at risk of heart attack, diabetes, you know, a whole range of uh, different health problems. Payton managed to stave off diabetes, as many Canadians have. In Canada, only 1 in 17 has the disease, a far healthier percentage than south of the border, where it's 1 in 13. And for anyone who's at risk in Canada, getting good health advice is as easy as a free trip to the doctor. But for Canadians like Wendell Oig, free health care wasn't enough to prevent his kidneys from failing five years ago. He says he never took the warning signs seriously. Now I'm sick and it just comes back to haunt you. And why, why did I not listen to that? I should have listened when I was stubborn. Wendell was first diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in 1990 when he was 23 and 300 pounds. He never took his doctor's advice to lose weight and eat healthier food. Just a year after his kidneys failed, he slowly went blind. I would have listened and ate everything I was supposed to eat. Wendell is Ojibwe, one of the groups making up Canada's 1.1 million Aboriginal people. And while diabetes was virtually unknown in Aboriginal communities 50 years ago, today it's reached epidemic proportions. Experts estimate one in four has the disease. Today we're, we live more of a sedentary lifestyle and the, the food that we were able to access now is not very good for our systems. A half century of change to traditional lifestyles has meant less physical activity and less access to a healthy natural diet and a greater reliance on cheaper processed foods. That's very concerning like that it's it should be a priority health issue on Canada's health agenda. So while Briere feels government has to act, she also thinks individuals can improve their own situations too. Winston Thompson has seen the disease tear through his family. Just a few years ago, his brother died from complications of the disease. Not even less than two years after he passed away that I was diagnosed with uh, diabetes. And so I thought, oh, okay, well, that doesn't sound like, it's not a good situation to be in. 
So he decided to get in shape. Now he watches what he eats and he monitors his blood sugar regularly. I think people are starting to become aware of it now because a lot of our people are experiencing the complications. Complications that people like Wendell can't get fixed, only treated. He's grateful he's able to access free treatments like dialysis, but that's little solace when he only has himself to blame for suffering through this new epidemic. Take a look at what happened to me. I didn't listen and... Do you want what I'm going through? The U.S. spends more money than any other country on health care, but it's not buying us longevity. Canadian men and women live at least two years longer than Americans. We wanted to speak with Canadian expatriates living in San Diego about which health care system they preferred and where do you find a Canadian in California? At the hockey rink, of course. This isn't Hockey Night in Canada. This is Hockey Night in Escondido, California. Who's from Canada? Almost all of these players are Canadian, a handful from Winnipeg. Yeah, like we've all been yeah. cut playing hockey, and you go That's to the wrong hospital, hospital if you're just new. When they're asked which country has better health care, Canada versus the U.S., there's no clear winner. Rob Carr moved here years ago from Alberta. His 22-year-old daughter can't get insurance because she once had a benign cyst on her ovary. Nothing, but now it's called a precondition, so she can't get health care anywhere. But Rob, that's the difference. We were talking about who falls through the cracks. That's Winnipegger Jeff Leibel. He's an immigration lawyer. He moved to San Diego 15 years ago and has a successful law practice helping thousands more Canadians immigrate to the U.S. The Canadians' biggest fear of moving to the States, without a doubt, is uh, the health care system. But it's a misconception that is usually cleared up when they visit an American doctor or see the inside of an American hospital. Libel's first experience with the health care system happened just months after he arrived in the States. He had pain in his leg for weeks. When he finally saw a doctor, he learned he had a blood clot. Libel says if he'd been living in Canada, he probably would not have seen a doctor. He assumed he'd have to wait weeks or even months for an appointment, and that could have been fatal. As a Canadian growing up, I, I feel that everybody should have access to health care. And the last thing you want to be worried about when you're sick is how am I going to pay for it or what am I going to do or am I going to get $100,000 in bills. Um, but you also should have access to good health care and immediate health care. There's no point having free health care if you're going to die waiting for it. Canada spends about 10% of its gross domestic product on health care. The U.S. spends more, about 16%. But still, here in America, one out of seven people has no health coverage. A lot of people will not agree with me on this, but I'm going to tell you that health care should be a right for every American. But not the way they do it in Canada, Jan Spensley says. She's a former hospital administrator turned advocate. I don't want to wait a year for an MRI like Canada does. And I don't want my father, who needed hip surgery, to wait for more than a year for hip surgery um, because it was debilitating. And so I think that we have to not, first of all, I don't use Canada as the only model. Um, I think that we need to be looking at the world and picking and choosing the best and what fits our culture and our world. I, I think it all comes down to is it a privilege or is it a right? I think in Canada they see it as a right, here we see it as a privilege. Libel believes health care is a right, but like a lot of Canadians accustomed to waiting, he feels privileged he has immediate access to care here in San Diego. It's something he wishes for his parents back in Canada. Sometimes I get the urge to say, get on a plane and come on down here and we can get that treatment down here quick. And then you take the results back home and have them deal with it. They haven't done it yet, but I can see it happening. Ron Leibel is Jeff's dad. He knows staying active plays a huge role in staying healthy. So he meets twice a week with his buddies at this Winnipeg curling club. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And for Ron, whoa, whoa, whoa. curling has become as Canadian as universal health care. He and his wife Anne have lived on the prairies their whole lives, and they see access to health care as one of the big advantages. Everyone gets it. That's the big virtue. What makes me happy about it is that everybody is covered. Outside of a few minor procedures, the Libels haven't had to rely too much on the healthcare system in recent years. 
But as they get older, they know they're covered, regardless of their pensions or other insurance plans. You know, we wouldn't dare go to the States without having uh, coverage uh, over and above what we have here. But that's exactly what their son Jeff did when he moved to San Diego 15 years ago. He went down with uh, not that much money at the time, and so we didn't know how he'd be able to afford it. Yes, there was a concern, obviously. Jeff eventually got a good job and health care coverage along with it. And his parents now believe he's in good hands if he or his family gets hurt or sick. It's wonderful, and they get, the, they get terrific coverage. Uh, they use the system uh, to their advantage and this sort of thing, and it, it works out well for them. So well, in fact, that even though the libels are big supporters of Canadian health care, they wouldn't rule out someday going south for specific treatments. And it's all because of where they see Canada falling short, long wait times for different services. I think it should be enhanced, uh, quite frankly. I think there should be um, uh, other, uh, other schemes, too, that should be outside the universal system. In Manitoba, you could wait up to seven weeks for a CT scan. If you need a hip replacement, you'll wait 14 weeks. And for cataract surgery, up to 10 weeks. If somebody wants to pay, they should be able to pay. There's an ongoing debate in Canada. Stick with a system where everyone has equal access to health care or allow for some private services, which would relieve wait times. But that would mean people who could afford it would jump ahead of the line. The libels see merit in a system that provides some private services. But for now, they're happy to be at home in Winnipeg, especially during a time of economic hardships right across the continent. Massive layoffs in the United States. Those people now have no medical coverage. At least that's my understanding anyways. They have no medical coverage. Layoffs are happening in Canada, but those people are still covered. And that's a big plus as far as I'm concerned. Now, a story about a man who, after spending a year recovering in a hospital, made his way to the top as president of one of San Diego's largest health care providers. Chris Van Gorder is president and CEO of Scripps Health. And just wait until you hear what he has to say about health care in America. You ready? With five hospitals, Good 10 morning. clinics, and 12,000 employees, Sorry, Rebecca, I interrupted you. Chris Van Gorder runs one of the largest corporations in the county. Hi, guys. Good morning. How are you? Good, how are you? Scripps Health is a nonprofit health care provider. Today, Van Gorder is sharing some good news with his employees. So, what do you think? Top 100? All right. Huh? Scripps has made Fortune Magazine's list of top 100 companies to work for. Mayo Clinic's three below us. It's been an unconventional road to the top for Van Gorder. He started out as a police officer, but was seriously injured on duty. Van Gorder spent a year as a patient and eventually left the force and changed careers, working his way up in the world of hospital administration. So I had, a, I guess, a fairly unique perspective on health care. When Van Gorder sat down to tell us about his perspective on health care, he was direct. The system in place now isn't working. It's full of gaps and has left hospital emergency rooms holding the bag. I mean, we really do have a national health care system. It's called the emergency room. But it's a very expensive way to get health care. By law, emergency rooms have to treat people regardless of their ability to pay. According to a San Diego study, nearly half the people in emergency rooms could have seen a family doctor instead. But we've literally have generations of families that believe that the, the emergency room is their doctor's office because, you know, their parents got care in the emergency room, so the children now get care in the emergency room because nobody else will take care of them. This kind of treatment is expensive. Scripps absorbed almost $240 million in medical bills that were never paid last year. Other hospitals in the county report similar costs. Sharp spent more than $257 million on unpaid care. Van Gorder tells the story of a 63-year-old man who walked into a Scripps emergency room almost three years ago. His diabetes was so out of control he needed his leg amputated. He spent a year recovering in ICU. He had no insurance. Um, it cost us over a million dollars to take care of this uh, gentleman. That's at cost, a million dollars. The story doesn't end there. The man had nowhere to go when he was better, but wasn't well enough to live on his own. So Scripps paid for the patient to live in nursing care at a cost of $86,000 a year.
I mean, this is a gentleman that because there is no other program in this country that will take care of him, and he came to our hospital emergency room, we have now have had to assume responsibility for his life, uh, and we could be paying for his care unless another system develops for the rest of his life. Those costs eventually get passed on to people who do have insurance. It's just one of the reasons hospital fees are so expensive these days and insurance rates are climbing. Van Gorder believes health care would be cheaper for everyone if everyone had health care. That is, a more regulated system that allowed everyone to buy in at affordable rates. I, I can't imagine looking at somebody that needs health care and saying, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have health care, I'm just going to leave you now. You can't do that as a health care provider. I mean, these are human beings that have a right to health care because we have the ability of delivering that health care. The issue isn't the desire of providers to give care. It's the economics of health care. That's the problem. We need to fix the economics of health care. President Barack Obama has committed to the creation of a health care reform bill this year. His proposal for a public health care plan is being opposed by private insurance companies and has been slow to gain support from legislators. Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary of Health and Human Services, was on the NewsHour recently, and she spoke about how the president's plan would impact all Americans. That he's a pretty strong proponent of a new marketplace for those Americans who can't afford the coverage they have, don't like the coverage they have, or have no coverage at all. A marketplace that would have private plans uh, standing side by side with a public option. Some competition and some choice for consumers he thinks is a very good thing, and so do I. We'll continue to cover this issue here on San Diego Week. Join us again next Friday night at 7. Thanks for watching.